bar class. Um, grateful to have you with us today, particularly anybody who's joined us for the first time. We, we welcome you. Let me see if I can get this little show going here. So this is a two hour virtual class. It will give you a CE credit. And just to quickly run through those points that Leslie Ann mentioned for this list informs and estimated sellers net sheet class division requires us to have your full name on the screen. Uh, of course, have your video on for the whole of the time. Uh, be in attendance for the whole of the class, of course, and be engaged and seen during the class. You have three keywords that will be shared with you during the class. And to help us on that, I have Mr. Merlin here with the keywords. He'll help me uh, share those with you on screen. So um, this is Presidio. Uh, training material, raising the bar. We certainly welcome anybody else that's joined us from other brokerages. We hope that you'll enjoy this class session. Now, uh, raising the bar is, when we see that gold bar, we're trying to raise the bar wherever we are, whatever we're doing uh, within our real estate industry. Hopefully we can just be a little better having had some more help and education and sharing ideas with each other. Every one of us is learning irrespective of how long we've been in the business for, whether we've just joined this month or whether we've been in the business for the last 30, 40 years, we can still learn and hopefully raise our bar of performance as a real estate agent. Our principal broker, uh, Presidio, is Jennifer Yeo, and she has made this statement which I'd like to share with you, uh, which I think applies to all of us from whichever brokerage we represent. Uh, doing the right thing in every area of our jobs only makes the industry better as a whole. Staying committed to that helps us all have a strong, resilient, long-standing career and will bring more referrals and businesses to you than you can ever imagine. That's why at Presidio, we pledge to raise the bar. I found this other interesting um, quote from former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, you'll recognise that name, Winston Churchill, and I thought this was a good one to share, uh, which hopefully will encourage us if we're into any uh, slow chapters in our industry. <clears throat> Success consists of going from failure to failure without the loss of enthusiasm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think that's great. Success consists of going from failure to failure without the loss of enthusiasm. Sometimes in this industry, we can feel that we may be uh, not reaching the mark that we would like to, uh, but let's still be enthusiastic and let's still move along and hopefully we shall see the end results of our labors. So this class is called Listing Forms and Estimated Sellers Net Sheet. We'll cover both of those topics in this class. Um, we'll first of all look at the the 10, <clears throat> excuse me, main listing forms uh, from the utahrealestate.com site. You'll be familiar with most of these, I think, but we'll go through them and just highlight some areas that may be helpful to us if we've not used them before. We'll then review the, uh, the process of building an estimated seller's net sheet. Um, I know some of us probably already do that, which is great. If we've not had the opportunity to do that, I'll run through some uh, basic principles that will show us how we can do that with our uh, listing client. So that's what we'll try and cover in this section. Let's first of all look at the listing forms and we'll start off with um, four or five of these. Remember these listing forms are agreements. It's a contract really between you, your brokerage and the seller. So we bring in these three different parts or different groups of people together in a contract or an agreement. We've obviously got the exclusive right to sell listing agreement, uh, which is the one that if any of us have done any business, we'll be familiar with. And uh, that's probably the most used listing form. Uh, we've got the exclusive right to sell this to an agreement and agency disclosure. Uh, this will be an addendum to that um, and often we've used that as well. We'll look at the, the addendum to exclusive right to sell listing agreements and agency disclosure. 
or the short sale. <clears throat> and we'll also look at the exclusive right to sell listing agreement, which talks about the sub agency addendum too. And finally, we'll review the cancellation and the termination of the exclusive right to sell listing agreement and agency disclosure. These are the first five listing forms that we'll be familiar with, and then we'll go through the other five. So first of all, let's have a look at this one that we're all familiar with. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to go in detail through this uh, because we do have a lesson actually, a class coming up, I think it's next, the next Monday or Tuesday, um, which you can see on the calendar where we go through this in great detail. But I'm sure that you're all familiar with this and it's a great document, um, well, well uh, written and hopefully keeps us out of trouble if we use it correctly, but also enables us to um, certainly uh, have a transaction go through to full settlement and close and earn us our income. This uh, is solely an agreement between us and uh, our brokerage and of course the seller. But we won't go through that in detail today. We'll do that at another time in another class which you can find online. This one is important to understand. It's the addendum that we would use to an exclusive right to sell listing agreement and agency disclosure. And incidentally, as Leslie Ann mentioned at the beginning, if any of you got any questions or comments or thoughts, particularly stories, I like to have you share stories of experiences you've had. Uh, please just unmute, unmute and uh, start talking and say, hey, Steve, I've got something to share on that. I'll certainly ask you some questions as we go through this presentation. But please be confident just to butt in and, and, and share your thoughts and ideas. We'd love to hear from, from you. <clears throat> All right, so this one we would use if we had a few other things we wanted to disclose or add to um, our uh, uh, initial exclusive right to sell agreement. It just simply says, uh, this is an addendum to the exclusive right to sell listing agreement and agency disclosure the listing agreement entered into on and we're going to put the date in there between and we'll first of all put the name of the seller uh, we'll put if we can there if it's, it's a husband and wife we'll put both their names in there and uh, then it will say whichever company we're with whichever brokerage we're with um, regarding the property located at and we'll put the property location in there the following items or following terms are hereby incorporated as part of the listing agreement. And to the extent these terms modify or conflict with any provisions of the listing agreement or data, these terms shall control. And then we're gonna put in there whatever it is that we're adding to the, uh, the, the original agreement. Stephen, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Carol. Thank uh, you. Um, what kind of examples can you give us where you would use this addendum? That's a great question. I'm going to throw that out to everybody first to see if anybody's got an actual story. I have not had share. a listing yet, so <laughs> this is new to me. That's great. Good. That will welcome to us and hopefully get your listing fairly soon. So let me just throw that question out because we've got about over 20 participants on here. And I'm sure there'll be someone who'll about to share with us how they've use this um, addendum and how they used it and what, what they wrote in there. Let's just open it up and see if someone can quickly respond. Now, there's bound to be someone out there that's used one of these. Or maybe I've got a, an associate broker or a principal broker on board that can share a story that someone else has had that they've worked with that's used one of these. Okay. Sorry for asking that question. <laughs> it's honestly a good question. Before I answer it now, I want to see if I can squeeze something out of someone on this class. Uh, let's see now. Um, let's see. Steve, Steve Perry, are you on board? He's one of our associate brokers. He's a regional manager. I'm sure he's got a, a, a story so, to share with us. Yeah, that there document's... Yeah, that document is typically used right now for any MLS changes because they don't have an MLS change form anymore. 
So if you're going to have your price adjusted or reduced or your listing um, commission, any of that reduced, you'll use this form now. Any adjustments to your contract with the seller will go on this form. Yeah, thank you, Steve, for sharing thank that. Um, the next one is a good one. You also may have a change of um, who the agreement's with, you know, your client. Uh, or you may have only just put maybe the husband on the exclusive right to sell this in agreement. Then we realize, oh, yeah, it, it's his wife that needs to be on there as well. Or there may be another party on there. And you can add that in here at the same time. So anything that is going to be added to that exclusive right to sell listing agreement, you just slip on this addendum, okay? Um, because that's solely to do with uh, that, that contract. Um, and it can be anything as, you, as you're going through a transaction, anything else that needs to be added that you need to uh, bring into the... Everything, everything remains as it is on the exclusive right to sell listing agreement, except for whatever you put on this addendum, if that makes sense. Whether you take something out or whether you add something in, um, what it does is everything is as it is, and whatever we take out or add in is now part of the original agreement. Um, the key thing in this is, is we never alter the exclusive right to sell listing agreement. We always alter it with an addendum, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Thanks for raising that, Kara. Anybody got any other comments or thoughts on this particular form? Notice here that it clearly says you've got the seller's signature. Okay, that's your client. And then it's accepted, accepted by the company. And notice here, it doesn't just have your name in here as the seller's agent, but it also has your principal broker's signature. It's very important because remember the principal broker is ultimately the one that is carrying the weight of these contracts. So you need to have he or she sign this contract. Stephen. Yes, thank you, Steve. Um, you can also have your branch broker sign where it says principal broker on any document they're authorized to by the division. Oh, okay. I wasn't aware of that. Thanks for sharing that. So you could have um, the branch broker sign on there if they're not actually the principal broker. Yeah, thank you. Okay, let's move on and let's go to the next one. Has anybody else got any comments on that particular form? Okay, well, we're up for our first um, keyword. Let's pull that one up. Just a reminder there, full name on the screen, video on, engage, and you supply three keywords. This one, of course, is going to be addendum. So this will be your first keyword. I think all the keywords in this particular class are A's. So addendum, A-D-D-E-N, A-D-D-E-N, D-U-M, addendum. That will be our first keyword on this class, okay? Quite easy to remember. We'll just jot that down, addendum. Hopefully we got that, let's move on. So now we have the addendum to the exclusive right to sell listing agreement and agency disclosure, which is the short sale. When I, when I first came over from England and I saw this short sale, for some reason I thought, oh, this will be a fast sale, meaning a short sale. It won't take long to get the sale done. It's probably the way my English brain was working. Of course, short sales aren't usually very quick. They usually take a little bit longer. Um, anyway, so we'll look at the first three sections of this. Um, obviously, we're going to put an addendum number up there. Remember, it's got to be a different number each time you put a, a number on addendum. So if we had filled out that previous addendum, the one we just talked about, and we pull, call that number one, this, of course, would be number two. Uh, but every addendum number must be different, or if it hasn't got a number there, it must be a different title so that it's absolutely clear it's a different piece of the puzzle. So it clearly says it's an addendum to the exclusive right to sell listing agreement and agency disclosure. Uh, again, entered on with a date, and it's between the seller's name and the brokerage, and we'll have the property location written in that line where it says property. 
Then it will say the following terms are hereby incorporated as part of the listing agreement and to the extent these terms modify or conflict with any provisions of the listing agreement, these terms shall control. So it's exactly the same wording as the previous one. And then we've got three pieces of the puzzle here to look at. The first one is acknowledgement of short sale disclosure. So here we're saying the seller acknowledges that seller has received from the company a form entitled short sale disclosure, which is obviously what we've got here. Seller acknowledges that seller has read, understands, and agrees with the information contained in the short sale disclosure. Number two, third party considerations. So seller acknowledges that a short sale is subject to third party approval. Third parties may impose conditions prior to approval of a short sale, including but not limited to a the third parties obtaining a broker price opinion of, or appraisal, B, requiring seller to demonstrate financial hardship, or C, requiring seller to provide copies of tax returns, pay stubs, assets, and other financial information. So there's quite a little bit of juice there. If we're gonna get involved in this, we need to make sure that our seller understands uh, their obligation to um, this form or this agreement. Seller authorization, so they authorize this to the company. This is what the company can do. They're saying, yes, you can do this. Advertise the property as a short sale in all marketing materials prepared by the company. B, advertise the property as a short sale on the MLS, obviously according to the rules and regulations of the MLS. C, continue to advertise the property for sale on the MLS, again, according to the rules until approval of the short sale by the third parties. D, contact the third parties to obtain lien payoffs or other related information regarding the short sale. E, communicate directly with the third parties on seller's behalf and provide to the third parties such disclosures, information and documentation requested by the third parties for the purpose of obtaining approval of short sale. And we've got another two pieces of this, but does anybody have any questions on any part of that form? I know it's quite clear, but are there any questions there? Remember again, this is agreement between you, your brokerage and your seller. So we have to get this right. So let's look at the last two pieces of three. Oh no, oh, that's a different form, okay. We actually got to the end of three on that one. It must be another four. I've got another two in there. Okay, the fourth section here is seller acknowledgements. So if the third party agrees to a short sale, then the seller may not receive any sales proceeds at closing. Of course, it's going to be a short sale, isn't it? Seller may be required by the third parties to bring some of seller's own funds to the settlement. Or, and... The third parties may seek a deficiency judgment against seller or pursue other collection efforts to record any loss incurred by the third party in accepting the short sale. And for even if third parties elect not to pursue a deficiency judgment, any short sale uh, discounted, so discount accepted by the third parties may be reported to the IRS by the third parties as taxable income to the seller. B, if the third parties refuse to approve the short sale, the property may go into foreclosure and seller may lose all legal and financial interest in the property. And obviously foreclosure is, is a worse situation than a short sale. Uh, could affect their credit for a long time. A short sale transaction may have a negative impact on sellers credit rating, even if the foreclosure process has not officially begun or once begun is not completed. And D, upon marketing the property as a short sale, seller may receive one or more offers for the purchase of the property, but the third parties may require that one offer be presented to the third parties for approval. Uh, e, there are other legal and financial options that seller may want to consider with legal counsel and tax advisors rather than a short sale 
including but not limited to negotiating a loan modification or refinancing or bankruptcy, foreclosure or a deed in lieu of foreclosure. F, the company has no control over the decision of the third parties to accept a short sale or over the timing associated with that decision. Now that's quite an important section there as well. Time will not be in, in their favor on this. Uh, sellers agree to hold the company harmless from acts or omissions of the third parties. And if the third parties do not cooperate or fail to communicate with the company, the company may cancel this listing agreement by providing written notice to the seller. If the property is conveyed to the mortgage insurer or a lien holder during the term of this listing agreement, then in such event, seller or the company may cancel this listing agreement prior to its expiration by providing written notice to the other party. And J, the brokerage fees referenced in this listing agreement are subject to third party approvals. This is the one that's got the extra two on. So anybody got any questions on any of those points? They're pretty clear actually. It's important that we make sure we go through this with our seller so they understand what they're signing. Here is, here is the other two. K, seller is advised by the company to consult with legal counsel and other professionals as provided in section five below. And uh, L, if the listing period referenced in section two of the listing agreement expires prior to third party approval, as defined in section two of the short sale addendum, seller and the company agree that the listing period shall automatically be extended until the third party approval deadline as defined in section four of the short sale addendum unless otherwise cancelled by the property in accordance with the terms and conditions of the listing agreement. So quite a bit there to chew on there, but if we have got a client that we're working with a short sale on, then we do need to make sure we go through this form so they understand what they're signing. And five is simply advice to consult with legal counsel and other professionals. Um, seller has been advised by a seller's agent, that's us, that the company, uh, sorry, uh, and the company that A, there may be significant legal and tax consequences and negative credit rating impacts uh, associated with entering into a short sale. B, seller is strongly encouraged by the company and the seller's agent, that's us, that before agreeing to a short sale, and entering into any agreement with a third party as defined in the short sale disclosure, seller should obtain and carefully evaluate uh, professional advice from legal counsel and tax advisors to ensure that the seller fully understands and accepts the legal and tax consequences of entering into an agreement and completing a short sale. Seller acknowledges and agrees that seller is not relying on seller's agent or the company regarding any interpretation of the legal and tax consequences of a short sale transaction. Basically, we're saying that we have nothing to do with this. We're not professionals in this area and they need to um, be aware of what they're signing and get counsel from uh, and advice from a professional. All of the times of the list, all of the terms of the listing agreement not modified by this addendum shall remain the same. Seller acknowledges that seller has read, understands, agrees to the terms of this addendum. And of course, here we'll have the seller signatures, and then it will be accepted by the company, uh, which can be, as you see there, authorized seller, agents, uh, and broker. So, any questions on this? Or does anybody have any stories on a short sale? I know we're kind of in a different sort of market at the moment, um, but we have got some season agents on this class who may have gone through the, the 2006, 7, 8, 9 time where they probably had a few of these to sign. Do you have any people out there who've got any stories for me or any um, experiences using this form? Hey, Stephen. Thank um, you, Steve. One of the most important things to remember on a short sale is that every bank does it differently. Um, I've never seen 
then do it the same. So they have different policies, like how many offers they'll accept at one time, or how long of a period of time they'll accept offers, or do they just want the first offer that comes in? And so you have to be familiar with the, whoever has the mortgage on it and the process that they're going to go through. And you also have to get a written letter from your client that says that you have permission to talk to the bank and also the title company has permission to talk to the bank. So those are really important things you got to get up front. So the bank sends out a short sale packet, the seller has to fill out and then the seller has to actually be approved to do a short sale. Not every seller is guaranteed to do a short sale. So those are your basic key tips when short sales start to happen. Very good advice. Thank you, Steve, for that. Yeah, you're right there. The loan company may not uh, allow your clients have a short sale. They may just go straight into foreclosure. So Stephen, that's a good thing. So yes. How, how does the commissions work? Are they reduced? So there's a form that they'll send and absolutely you put in, I've seen people put in 8% um, and the bank will decide what to pay on the commissions. And I've seen it paid. I've seen eight paid. I've seen six paid. You never reduce your commissions on a short sale. Yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, I still have a lot of questions on it. Are we going to have any training just on short sales at some point? I think that may be something we could look at down the track, won't it, Steve? That could be something we could tie in. Yeah, absolutely. Doing a short sale class is easy. Um, it's just a matter of will it be CE and or um, when are short sales relevant to really start teaching, right? So, yeah. And they might start becoming relevant depending on people if they can on how this PPP money plays out. If people can't pay back this bulk amount of money that they've put off for their payments, we're actually starting to think that we might see a few short sales come come our way if they can't afford it and they can't get out from under it with even though they may have a lot of equity. It's all got to play, you know, the right scenario. OK, so. thanks. Very good. Thank you. Thank you to both. OK, let's move on to the next form. Um, remember, all these forms look at the moment are just between you and your client and obviously your brokerage. Uh, this is an important one that I think we probably use a little bit more often in this market. And this is the exclusive right to sell listing agreement <clears throat> sub agency addendum. So the top bit's more or less exactly the same language that we've already read through. Uh, but this is what this one says. By signing this listing agreement, the seller designates the seller's agent, the principal branch broker for the company, which is a broker and every real estate agent affiliated uh, with the company. So we've got a few things in this little piece. We've got this little nugget here that's about basically saying anybody in that brokerage can deal with the client. I'll just highlight a few of these for you. We talk a bit about judiciary duties in this section, the limited agency bit, um, being neutral, and of course it's Again, the agreement is between these three different parties or players. Um, <clears throat> so on, he goes on to say here, as agents for the seller, the seller's agent, the broker, and the affiliates have judiciary duties to the seller that include loyalty, full disclosure, confidentiality, and reasonable care. If the buyer that desires to acquire the property is represented by another brokerage, then the seller's agent, the broker, and each of the affiliates will continue to represent the seller. However, if the buyer that desires to acquire the property is also represented by the seller's agent, or the broker, or any of the affiliates, then the seller's agent, the broker, and each of the affiliates will, as a practical matter, be representing both the seller and the buyer in the same transaction. Representing a buyer and a seller in the same transaction is referred to as a limited agency. A limited agency or agent has judiciary duties to both the buyer and the seller. However, those duties are limited because the limited agent cannot provide to both parties undivided loyalty. 
full confidentiality and full disclosure for all information known to the limited agent. For this reason, the limited agent is bound by a further duty of neutrality. Uh, being neutral, the limited agent may not disclose to either party information likely to weakening or weaken or, or bargaining position of the other. For example, the highest price a buyer will offer or the lowest price a seller will accept. And this is in capital letters, so it's kind of shouting out to us to pay attention. The seller is advised that neither the seller nor the buyer is required to accept a limited agency situation in the company. And each party is entitled to be represented by its own agent. And finally, if limited agency is agreed to below, the seller authorizes the seller's agent, the broker, and each of the affiliates to represent both the seller and the buyer as limited agents when the seller's agent and the broker also represent the buyer for the property. So um, one thing that really shouts out to me here, which we don't often talk about, is the, the word duty of neutrality. Uh, being neutral is important. It's, so if you are in a situation where you're representing both parties, you've got to think, I need to be neutral on this piece because it can help one party uh, above the other. Or I've got to disclose everything. So we have to think about that on the, uh, the limited agency. It's not the best platform. It's ideal for you just to represent one um, person. But of course, uh, it, it does happen. And this form is used quite often. If you notice in the big black capitals, it now says if limited agency is agreed to below, the seller and the buyer will be required to sign a separate limited agency consent agreement at the time the limited agency situation arises. Um, and then obviously we can have everybody sign. I'm sure we've got quite a few people on this class and have filled out one of these. Um, that Leslie and I, Leslie and I, we actually had one of these filled out just recently because uh, uh, our broker was, was the seller and the owner of the house, and we had a client that was buying it. So that was quite interesting. Uh, but these, these uh, contracts are their protectors and also to, for us to be transparent with our client. Anybody got any questions or comments or Thank any you. stories? Yes. Um, so it says at the time it arises. So after a buyer makes the offer, then you have to have this form? Or how does that so, work? Yeah. How does the timing work? It should be, as, as far as I understand, absolutely immediate, as soon as possible. Is that how you understand it, Steve? So this form isn't your typical limited agency form that you know is going to be limited agency that you stand in with a rep seat. This one is you received one and then all of a sudden, or you received an offer and you know now that you're going to be acting as a limited agency, as a limited agent. Now you have to have the seller to agree to that. And so you use this form for the seller to agree that now we're going to be in limited agency position on the listing. Before you accept any offer. Yeah, they sh this should be filled yeah. out technically yeah. okay. before. Thanks. Yeah. So if, if someone in your brokerage, for instance, um, has a buyer and you're representing the seller, then before you would accept that offer, you would need to fill out this form. So that every, so the seller knows that they're actually dealing with ultimately the same company and the, 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 the same brokerage. Does that make sense? Can't you do it at the same time? You can do it at the same time, yeah. As, as, as long as the seller is... Well, ultimately, the, the seller needs to be signing this before they sign the acceptance of the offer. Well, right. But if you end up writing an offer and you get the buyer to sign it, you send both the rest. Yes, yeah, you can do that. And yes, yeah. all at the same time, it, makes, it puts out an extra step. Yes. Your buyer doesn't walk. Correct. Yes. Very good, Scott. Yeah, you can do it all at the same time. But ultimately, if you did want to, if you got three or four things for them to sign. This is the one they sign first, but they can do all the whole packs together. Absolutely. They need to know that they will be dealing with um, possible compromisation in the sale if they're dealing with a limited agency platform. 
Okay, let's move on. Hopefully, we don't have to fill this one out too many times. I actually haven't filled one of these out, so um, we've probably got someone on here who has. It's a very simple agreement. It's the cancellation and termination of the exclusive right to sell listing agreement and agency disclosure. Um, it's very clear, it says in capital letters under the title there, this is legally binding. Read carefully before signing. So exclusive right to sell listing agreement and agency disclosure, I've got the company in there and obviously the seller's name. And then you've got the date in that third line. And then what's interesting in this section two is mutual termination of agreement. So both parties agree to mutually release each other from any and all obligations, claims, liability, and demands arising, uh, arising out of the agreement, including, but not limited to, the agreement protection period, unless, unless we check that little section. I want to highlight that, I think I've got it highlighted there. There we go. So if we, if we check this section 2A, we're basically saying that the agreement's protection period is not cancelled or terminated. Who knows what the agreement protection period is and what it usually is. It can be anything we want, actually, but usually. People that you've shown the property to. Yeah, okay. And how, how does that protect uh, you as the agent, Scott? What's the benefit to you if you check this? Well, if you've done all the work, you want to make sure that you're protected for after it's cancelled. And you might not have, you might have a problem with the seller. You might want to cancel the listing yourself. Yeah, so if someone else comes in, you know, uh, and they purchase the home, you're going to still get paid because of the work you've done. Often people are putting there three months that you, you could put a different amount if you wanted. But generally three months is, is what most agents will put in there uh, that's in the contract. Uh, it also, it also tries to prevent a potential seller thinking, okay, I don't want to deal with you anymore as my agent. We've, uh, we're not happy with you. Let's, let's close this agency agreement up. And the reason they're doing it is because they have another seller. Maybe it's a friend uh, or a family member or someone who's coming in and say, yeah, I'll buy your house, get out of your agency agreement and then you know we'll just deal with you direct and then they can start paying the commission so this little section here is designed to hopefully prevent uh, that uh, so safety. we need to check the box to protect ourselves correct yep yep definitely okay. check the box. yeah definitely check the box i'm not sure how many um how many platforms there would be if you were not going to check the box maybe if you if the person decided they're not going to sell their home anymore and it's going to be taken off the market, then maybe you wouldn't check the box. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if anybody's got any experience of not checking the box. I'd always check the box if it was me. Anybody got any other thoughts on not checking the box or why they would not check the box? Stevie, give me a nod to let me know what you think. So let's say you're mutually splitting up. They fired you, whatever it is, um, and they don't want any connection with it anymore you're releasing the listing somebody else is going to get the listing you wouldn't check the box you would not check the box you mean yeah you would not check the box yeah. so it's a fully yeah. released listing yeah so they're doing a complete breakdown of communication and you're not going to work with each other anymore very good. although the other form the exclusive right to sell listing agreement says that as soon as the new the new agent gets that form signed with the other, um, with the seller, it automatically cancels the, that section in this form. Uh, the protection period is automatically canceled once a new listing agreement is signed. Yes, that's correct. that's correct. Very good. Any other comments on that? Should we move on? Very good. Let's go on to some of these other listing forms. I'll probably need to move a bit quicker. I notice my time is running out here. So we'll go through these next. This next little group is um, sellers' disclosures. So we've basically got uh, these three items, which are all on sellers' disclosure. So let's have a quick look at these. We won't go into too much detail on these, but you've probably seen this before. 
And this is quite a large document, seven pages in this document. And basically it's the seller disclosing everything that's happened that they know about in the home. And they've got to answer all of those questions, okay? Make sure uh, as soon as you've got a listing agreement, let's get this form signed, filled out quickly, um, so that we've got it ready to give to our potential buyers. Because sometimes some of the items on this seven page form can be, uh, may need some research in order for the seller to get the answers to them, okay? So this sheet goes on. Just remember when you're signing this sheet, you've got to sign at the end of each page. It's sometimes easy to forget that you've got seller signatures at the end of each of these pages. All right. Yeah, sign at the end of the page. And I believe the last part of this. Okay. Okay. So that one is the, the general um, property condition disclosure, which is the seven page one we generally sell. We've got the land one, which is quite different. Um, you'll notice there are some very different questions. So look down here, you've got, you know, natural gas, is it stubbed to the lot line or not? You know, sometimes it's not even got a name of a road, it might just have a coordinate or something. So you've got to look at this carefully. It will talk about the septic or the, the sewer tank, if there's going to be one there, culinary water, if it's going to be private or public, talk about maybe it's going to be a well if it's in a rural area. Um, talk about the irrigation water, it will talk about soils, and it will talk about boundaries and access, and it will also talk about flooding and drainage. So this is before any building has been put on the land. This is um, a seller disclosing everything they know about the land to a potential buyer. So it's quite a different form. It's got different questions in there, but let's again make sure we get it all signed up and, and ready to go. Then we have the addendum, um, which is very simple. Again, it would be a different number up there, remember, and we would uh, indicate on here clearly uh, what is different to the uh, disclosure that we've filled out on the other form. So I put there, you know, use this addendum to clarify and explain in more detail repairs, defects, problems, or malfunctions described on the disclosure form. So it gives you an opportunity to ex expand a little bit more information than you would have otherwise. Any questions on the seller's property dis uh, condition disclosure forms? Um, I'll just make sure you get those done early. As soon as you've got a client and you've got your um, exclusive right to sell listing agreement done, I suggest you get this form out and get them to fill it so you've got it done and you're ready to go. Uh, because once you get an offer in, you want to be fast tracking as quick as you can. You don't want to be chasing your client to fill out one of these forms. Yeah, I have a question, Stephen, really quick. Um, with the market the way it is right now and people having earnest money going hard, um, yeah. right at acceptance, is it possible for a buyer's agent to request the seller's disclosures before they make the offer? That's a great question. I presume it is possible they could ask to do that. And I, if, if you were the seller, if I was a seller, I'd probably say, yeah, I can show you that. It helps them make a, a hopefully a wiser decision. I don't think there's any problem um, disclosing the information you have on the property. You want to sell the property. So give as much information as you possibly can. That's a great question. Anybody I've else got any thoughts on that? No, I've seen some that they put this on the MLS with like the additional um, documents. That's correct. And I've seen they put the seller's disclosures right there so you can see it before you ever even see the house. Yep, you're absolutely right. I've seen that as well. And I think in this particular market, it's probably an advantage to do that because it may give you just a little bit of a, a nose in on another agent that's uh, not done that. So great idea. Any other thoughts or comments on the uh, SBCDs? Hey, Steve, do you use this addendum on both, both sets of um, disclosures? If you have additional yep. information? Yeah. Yeah, this is a this is a form can be used on either one of them. Okay. Very good. There's another couple of forms in here. Um, there's the lead-based paint disclosure and the opt-out. Uh, so the lead-based the lead-based paint disclosure is one that we 
will often uh, need to use. And then there's the, the property photography opt-out form. So let's have a quick look at those. This one's real simple. Um, and basically, if our house is old enough, get into the 70s there, we'll, we'll, we'll know to use this one. I won't go into this great detail because I've just noticed my time is running quicker than my slides are. Uh, but basically we are clearly as a seller acknowledging that, you know, we could have some um, lead paint based hazards or material in the home. Uh, so in that section one, it clearly says presence of lead based paint and or lead based paint hazards. And if you known it, you'll check the one known uh, or you'll check the one that the seller has no knowledge. In, or you've moved to the B, it may say um, records or reports available to the seller. So the seller has provided the purchaser with all available records and reports pertaining to the lead-based paint and or lead-based paint hazards in the home. And then we've got the, the double I that says seller has no reports or records pertaining to such. Um, what's important on this one is that C, I wonder if I got that highlighted on this slide. Oh yes, I did, okay. So if you're gonna use this form, it's important you use this little, this little pamphlet. I'll show you that in a moment if you've not seen it. It's the EPA pamphlet. And you'll submit that with this disclosure. So as a seller, if you fill out this disclosure form, you'll send it to your potential buyer and you need to also attach the EPA pamphlet. Let me show you what that looks like. It looks a bit like this. Uh, you can pick it up online. I guess you could send them an electronic version. Uh, that's what we usually do these days, but if not, you could give them a hard copy, uh, but electronic is probably the easiest way to move it. And you'll, you'll notice on here, it, it covers quite a lot of information. It's quite a detailed pamphlet. So we're looking at any homes that were uh, built um, or rented before uh, 1978. That's your, that's your key uh, year there. And this pamphlet will go through how lead gets into the body, how lead affects your health, what you can do to protect your family, and where you go for more information. It will also go into some detail about the health um, and, and why we need to be aware of uh, lead-based hazards in our home. And then it will give you some sort of a checklist at the back there, and you can kind of go through some of these items. They're really good. You know, don't try and remove it yourself, get a professional in there, you know, take precautions when exposing yourself to, you know, remodeling the home or whatever. So this is quite a detailed little pamphlet. It's worth looking at. If you've not seen it before, it's worth perusing. Uh, but if you are in a position where you're selling a home that's uh, been built or rented before 1978, then you'll need to disclose the lead paint based pamphlet. Any comments or questions on that? Okay. Um, at the very bottom here, you're obviously uh, going to accept, the buyer is going to accept that they've received these disclosures and they're going to uh, check the appropriate boxes that apply and sign it off. Then we have the photo opt out form. Um, there are some people that would like to sell a property, particularly investors, maybe they don't want, let's say, photographed. Uh, this form is used when a seller does not want listing photographs or the seller's property to be included as part of the seller's listing in the Utah real estate.com multi service listing. Um, provide the following information. So you've got the MLS number, you've got the property address, Instructions for withholding listing photographs. So the seller hereby instructs the listing agent and listing brochure to withhold photos from the MLS, which includes any public facing website which obtains photographs from the MLS for the listing reference uh, above as follows. So we've got two options there. Do not include interior photos of the properties, but include, sorry, do not include, oh, but include exterior ones, or we've got don't include any photographs. So sometimes they just want the, um, the exterior ones and not the interior ones. Maybe because they're gonna do some work in there to maybe sell it as, a, as, a, as a, re a rebuild or a refurbished property. 
Any questions or any stories on the photo opt-out form? Stephen? Yes. <laughs> um, just, I know our agents know I posted it, but from a, a meeting um, with the MLS starting May 1st, we're only gonna, the MLS is only gonna require two photos, one inside and one exterior as the minimum. Oh, really? So that'll start May 1st. Oh. oh, that's their minimum? Yeah, that'll be the new minimum starting May 1st. So what about this form then? Uh, the form's probably still gonna stay the same. It's just that they're required only the two photos now as a minimum, so. Okay. So if someone doesn't want any photographs displayed, they'll still have to produce two. Um, I, they probably can use this opt-out form still, but instead of the rules now. Okay. Is that right. rule okay. of saying that they have to have an interior photo too? Because that would be nice to say one exterior and one interior. Yeah, that rule is one interior, one exterior. They have to have it. That will be nice. Yeah, May 1st. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks for that. Perfect. Any other comments on this form? All right, so we've really gone through the, the 10 main listing forms that we have access to. There's obviously the exclusive right to sell listing agreement. There's the, um, the addendum to that one. And we've got the short sale one we looked at. Then we've got the sub-agency addendum. And then we've got the cancellation uh, then we've got the seller's property condition disclosure, which I think most of us are familiar with. That's that big seven page one. And then we've got the, the shorter one, which is on the land, but different questions. And then we've got the addendum that we can use for either. And then we've got the lead paint disclosure and acknowledgement. And then we've got the property photo opt out. So they're the 10 main listing forms that we've got that we can use as we work with a listing agent. The key thing here is to be as accurate as we can and to give as much information as we possibly can to our client. Make sure when they're signing these forms, they do understand what they're signing. OK, that's part of our job to make sure that they have read the form and uh, or we've given them a brief summary of what the sort of the form means. Uh, to make sure they understand what they're signing. That's that's important. OK, before we go to seller's next sheet, anybody got any questions on the forms? OK. All right, we're about halfway through, about right now. So let's look at this. We've got the, uh, the estimated seller's net sheet. We'll have a look at this in some detail, see what we've got to try and figure out. But simply, it's an estimated sales price. Basically, it's going to be the estimated sales price less all the fees or deductions. Although the estimated components can vary from one transaction to another, the overall calculations are similar, which can give you a realistic estimated bottom line for the seller, showing them how much they will make or lose on the sale of their property. It's probably the most important part of our early conversations with a client I want to know what they're going to make out of the home or what they're going to lose out of the home, what it's going to cost to sell uh, their home. You know, we also usually want to know how much it's going to cost to buy a home if you're doing both. Um, generally speaking, um, I think in this industry, we've, we've usually used the, you know, around 1%, 1 of the seller's price to sell, around 3% to buy. But let's go into a little bit more detail and see how close that might be. It obviously depends on, on what they owe and what expenses they've got. So let's start off and look at some parts of the estimated seller's net sheet. So first of all, we've got some title expenses. Let's look at those. We've got um, some government payments, most likely going to be paid. And obviously we've got our realtor fees. We definitely need to get those paid. And then there'll be some other fees. So let's have a look at these four little sections and see if we can figure out roughly what sort of payments we might be working with. So first of all, title expenses. You've got your title deed 
and you've got your title insurance, you've got your title service, and you've got your title service. They're usually the four pieces of the puzzle that the title are going to need paying for. So let's first of all look at the title deed. So first of all, let's talk about what these are, because often your client may ask you a question, and say, well, what's, what is this? I've not done this before. What, I, what am I paying for? And what is it that uh, is the purpose of it? So let's look at this. Title deeds serve several purposes, obviously. Identify the owner of a part of the real property. Um, includes information that defines the boundaries and location of a unique uh, piece of land and can preserve the chain of title ownership history, which is also pretty important. Um, let's talk about that slide. Do I have another one in there? Oh, no, I don't. Let's just go back on that. Let's just go back on that one a minute. Let's just talk about the title deed first. Anybody got any questions on title deed or any comments on title deed or any areas that they've um, encountered that have been a challenge with the deed. Okay, no challenges, that's good. Well, just remember if your client asks you about what the deed is, you're going to tell us all about ownership of the piece of real property that we're talking about here. It'll talk about who owns it, talk about the, the boundaries of that property, you know, the location of it. Um, and it'll also talk about the chain of ownership, which is really important because you can see the history of where it's come from. And you can see that it's been owned by people, you know, from um, uh, time to time. Stephen, um, just to yes. add, you know, whether we're representing the buyer or the seller, we need to read those. So we don't get ourselves into trouble. Don't assume the title company has it. You know what I mean? Um, we, we need to look it over and read it. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and sometimes when you're working with a, um, you, you, you're representing the seller uh, and, and a buyer comes in looking at the, the property, they may have some questions. They may say, hey, <clears throat> can you show me a plat map? Can you show me a bit more history on this? You know, can you show me some more information? We can go to that deed and we can probably find out. And sometimes the title companies may not dig that deep enough. So it's our job to, to work with the title company and ask them for further information. So yeah, good, good point. Let's look at re what recording the title deed is. It's another interesting question that often will come. A real estate deed is recorded at the office of the county recorder in the, in the county where the property is located. This may also be referred to as the Register of Deeds or Clerk of Courts or Office of the Judge of Probate or Recorder of Deeds. So we've got different sort of bits of languages depending on which county you're in, but they're, they're the little titles we're looking at when we're talking about recording a title deed. Recording fees aren't very much really. Um, usually around $80 is about what title companies are charging for a, uh, a deed, uh, which is reasonably good. Um, if there are other documents that are going to be recorded, like a home warranty or something, it may charge around $40 for those. So not, not, not a huge amount of money for those. I should have asked any, any questions on that. Let me ask any questions on the title. Deed. Any questions on the title? You don't need to add to that slide. Okay, we can move on then. Title insurance. Now, we all have motors, or most of us do, just like car insurance. We're going to need this title insurance. Anybody got an idea what title insurance is? I'll just throw out a question there, see if we can get anybody to respond. Let's look at some of these. So very much will protect the owner and hidden defects, even after a detailed search, might not raise the alarm until several months 
four years after the owner has purchased the property. This is why title insurance is very important and mandatory for every purpose. I oh, sorry, every purchase. So that's what we do it for. And sometimes we may not find a property that has a problem with title that, that, that may need some title insurance until you know a few months or years down the track. Any comments on that slide? Okay, let's carry on. Some issues that an owner is protected from with title insurance. So mistakes in recording or indexing legal documents. Remember these, uh, these recordings are done by people and sometimes people you know, make a mistake because that's what we do. And it will protect us from those errors. Um, definitely forgeries and fraud it protects us from. Um, undisclosed or missing heirs, other important thing it protects us from unpaid taxes and assessments, unpaid judgments and liens, unreleased mortgages, mental incompetence of grantors on the deed, impression of, uh, sorry, imp impersonation of true owners of the land by fraudulent per persons. And I think that's all of the items on there. Any questions or comments on those? This is what we're getting protected from. Is there another one? Oh yeah, refusal of a potential purchaser to accept title based on the condition of the title. So we get a lot of protection from title insurance. Um, very important to have, and it's good for us to understand that we are getting protected when we pay that. Any questions or comments on title insurance? All right. This is a good part of title insurance. No monthly or yearly payments. We just pay the once. We pay once and we're done. The only will, uh, one time premium that will cover the title insurance policy uh, obviously varies, which can vary by state, but generally it's related to the value of the property. So the way in which this is worked out depends on the value of our property. See if I can explain this a little bit more detail to you. So let's take an example of about a $300,000 house. <clears throat> and we'll, we'll look at what our title insurance might come out at. So generally speaking, at the moment, in Utah, it's about 60 cents per hundred dollars of the sales price. So if it's on 300,000, probably looking around $1,800 there. It's about how much we could pay. Okay, and obviously these are variable and you need to check with your title company um, that this is like a general rule of thumb that we can work with. Okay. Any questions on that? Let's talk about our title service. Also referred to on title documents as a processing fee. Varies from company to company, but typically between 500 and 800 for transaction, might be more or less depending on the company and the price of the house. So it gives you an idea of roughly what they're going to be paying for your processing fee. Any questions or comments on that? Then we've got the search. Usually, Title companies are charging around $150 for that. So the title search will determine who the true owner of the property is. It may also be helpful to identify any problems associated with the, problem, with the property, such as misinformation or incorrect names on deeds or unpaid real estate taxes. So not very much there. $150 is about what we'll pay for the search. Any questions or comments on that slide? Searches also identify loans, child support lien, judgments against the property, which need to be handled, obviously cleared up before closing. So the, the search is quite a simple thing, um, but important to be done, and the title company will do that. Okay, before we move into government payments, anybody got any questions on the title, pays, title money? 
Um, I have a question. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so like the title service, the title search, like all these fees, these are all just included in like the sale of the home, right? Yeah, when you go to the settlement, that's what the title company will charge the, the, the sellers, correct? Okay, I just yeah. want to make sure. Um, Steven, I, yes. I don't know if anybody else has done this, but the only way we got a recent house <clears throat> or transaction was having the earnest money go hard. But I'm, when I really think about it, I should have um, put as an item or an addendum that um, subject to clear title, so, you know, have some outs because you don't really get the, you have a commitment to title from the seller, but you don't really see the information until midstream. So, you know, if there was any problem on title and you have your earnest money going hard, it's another issue to protect your buyers. Um, has anybody done that? That's a great question. Um, has anybody done that? No, but it's why so it also makes me nervous that we might not be competitive if we put something like that. Mm, good point, Jenny. Steve, you're going to comment? I've seen sellers say that they're not going to have it. They're not going to pay for it. And it's it's their oh. right. They don't, they don't have to have it. Oh, so the buyer, if they wanted it, would have to pay it. Well, the buyer has to have theirs so that they're insuring the loan on the property. The mortgage company makes them do it unless it's a cash deal. But I've seen sellers say, we don't have a lien on the property. We're not buying this. We're not paying for this. And okay. yeah, it can happen. It's not very okay. often people know those rights though. Yeah. Is there anywhere in the Rep C that states that the seller is going to provide that or is that an assumption? Uh, not that I know. It's not in the Rep C at all. It's not in any contract. So it's always just an assumption that they will provide it then, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Does that clarify some of our questions? Thank you for your input, folks, on that. Very good. Okay, let's look at some of these government payments. Let's get into some bigger pieces of the puzzle here. So we've got these property taxes, um, also known as ad valorem or non ad valorem taxes. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then we've got the municipal lien search as well, which title companies will get involved in both of these. So let's look at these two topics and see if we can um, make a head and a tail of them. Oh, here comes our second, uh, our second keyword. All right, you should probably gonna know what it is. It's an A word and it's ad valorem. Ad valorem, you got that. A-D-V-A-L-O-R-E-M, ad valorem. It's a funny word that is, isn't it? We're trying to figure out what it means. Ad valorem taxes or non-ad valorem taxes. Anybody got any idea what ad valorem means? I know when I first moved over here, I had no idea what it meant. In England, we do have what's called VAT, which is value added tax, which is probably about the closest I could get to this. But ad valorem, let's look at this, shall we? Let's see what ad valorem tax is, see if we can learn a little bit. Might be helpful to us when we're talking to our client. An ad valorem tax, which is Latin for according to value, this tax amount is based on the value of a transaction or of a property usually imposed at the time of a transaction, okay? So that's what it is. It's called ad valorem tax, and it's based on the value of the transaction or the property, in this case, obviously, the property value. Let's look at some facts about this ad valorem tax, see if we can figure out um, why we have it and what it means. So it is a significant annual expense um, that an owner's got to pay every year. The tax is due, even when the mortgage is paid off. So whether they've got a mortgage or not, we're still going to be paying this ad valorem tax, which is property taxes. 
Local authorities set guidelines to determine and assess property taxes, which can vary from region to region. So, you know, these are not going to be exactly the same in every place. Property tax bill is based on the property's value. The exception is qualifies, the exceptions qualify for its use and local property tax rate. Okay, so we're basically looking at um, our tax that we get each, each year. What is it? It's on November the 30th, isn't it? Property assessments are conducted annually or every other year or when the property changes ownership. In this case, when we're selling a house, that's when it's going to be applied. So how's it calculated? And when it comes in, assessment is either the market value or the market value multiplied by an assessment rate. And that's what we tend to have here in Utah is usually it's the assessment rate that's multiplied by the market value. We'll look at what that rate is in a moment. Exceptions may include a decrease in your assessment value if you are an owner occupant, which most of us are. The decrease does not reflect the market property value, but will lower the taxes. Your property's use is another consideration, it could be used for residential, office, or barn, or other purposes that will affect this property tax. So properties used for religious or spiritual purposes may get an exemption from this tax. The property tax rate is a percentage by which the assessed value of your property is multiplied, uh, which will determine your tax bill. Property taxes for schools, libraries, parks, police, fire protection, and uh, many other services uh, will, will be able to be funded by this tax. Each service has its own rate multiplied by its property assessed value, then added together to give you a final amount on your tax. And often when you get this report in, it will kind of um, item some of these areas so you can see what you're paying, you know, in certain parts of the community. Obviously can vary depending on the property value or the tax rate. So that's what your ad valorem tax is. Let's see what the non ad valorem tax is. Non, -ad non ad valorem tax is not based on the value of the property. This tax is assessed on certain benefits to your property, which may include services such as landscaping, security, lighting, or trust, uh, disposal, etc. That's what your non ad valorem tax is. Okay, let me go back to that one. Um, any questions on the ad valorem tax? We'll go through the figures in a few moments, but any questions or comments on the ad valorem or the non ad valorem tax, which is all down as property taxes? Anybody got any comments or thoughts on that? Okay. This is quite simple municipal lien search, simply is. Um, a search that will identify outstanding issues related to tax or utilities, liens, permits, and other violations that may involve the property. Um, so often the title company will do that as well. Okay, let's look at these property taxes and see how these figures pan out. Okay, we all know that date. And I will say, if you don't pay on the 30th of November, they'll start charging your interest on the 1st of December. That's just how it works. So we all know that date comes up every year. Um, often we're paying our mortgage and we're paying into an escrow a certain amount of money so that when we get to November the 30th, that property tax can be paid because it usually is a sizable amount of um, money. Utah's average effective property tax rate at the moment is around... Uh, 
58.58%. So uh, it's the, it, apparently it's the 11th lowest in the USA. I found that information out, it's quite interesting. Typical homeowner can expect to pay about uh, 1,900 annually for property tax payments. That's uh, across Utah. Let's look at an example here of a $300,000 house. And we'll see if we can figure out what the tax might be for property taxes. So we take that 58, okay, and we multiply it by the uh, sale of the house. And then we're going to come up with about 1740. That's what this would come out at if we were looking at this scenario. Okay. Any questions on property taxes? So we've probably seen here, we've probably got a similar amount of money for that big insurance payment we're paying and the property taxes a similar amount on the price of this house. Any questions or comments on that? Okay. I like this slide. I hope you all like this slide. This is the most important part of the, the business, isn't it? Make sure we get paid. So realtor fees, important we factor those in to the uh, seller's net sheet. Uh, typically a total of 6%. I know at the moment we're seeing um, less than that just because we're kind of in a seller's market. Um, but usually that 6% will be three and three, three to the seller's agent, three to the buyer's agent. Personally, I wish that Utah would say, this is it, it's 6%, and we should all play by the same rule, no discounts, three and three, because I think that'd be a real fair platform and it'll be good for us. So that's what I say. But That's I'm not gonna to happen it. because of all the discount rule too, and homey and so forth, which I disagree that the uh, board agreed to let them on the MLS. That's my yeah, opinion. What I, and what I'm saying, Scott, is I think they should apply the same rules to them. And they, because you see what would happen if, if they did that with, with these other discount brokerages, um, the actual service in this industry would actually rise. I agree with that, but it's been going on forever. It has. Because what, what, it, what it does, it, all, it just reduces the competency and the, and the service and the, the, the talent in this industry. It, it, it helps people cut corners and do a, a poorly job. And, and the client never knows this. The client thinks they're getting the same deal from a discount brokerage as they are from a, a, a proper brokerage, but they're not. But if the state made it that way um, and it's stuck to a 6%, a lot of times um, reducing commissions makes the deal and you have no choice if You're you right. want to make the deal or not. You're right. And that's, and that, that's in my opinion, it's, it's uh, disappointing that we have to be put in that position. You know what I mean? Because sometimes that can compromise our uh our efforts but yes you're right yeah well especially if it's a large transaction million two million bucks um yeah you know, that's, that's uh, uh something that should and, be I, and if you look at it yes there's the answer. i was just going to say i think there the, the problem is there's legal impl implications with uh the this and i wondered if steve perry would chip in What's the question? Um, about the idea would be that there was just a flat, everyone did the 6%, 3% to a buyer's agent and 3% to a, a listers, listing agent and not have people change those fees. But Yeah, there's no such thing as a set fee in real estate. The Department of Justice has made that very clear to us. And that's where uh, all the lawsuits came from is people were starting to market that there's a set fee in real estate and there's there's not there never has been and there won't be in utah for that reason yeah it's one of the things we have to work with it's difficult 
And it's, it's difficult today, particularly in a seller's market, where you've got a buyer's agent that may end up spending literally hundreds of hours working with a client to find a home um, because there's not much inventory on the market and they're getting rejected um, continually with offers. They're still going to find their home and they're still, you know, they may only be getting 2% or 2.5% two on the buyers of that home. And it's, it, it's difficult. It's difficult for agents that are having to spend so much time because they're getting so many offers that are being rejected. Uh, we had an agent that told that they had to tell their client who was given a, the 16th time rejection of their offer. I mean, think about that 16 times. I don't know how many houses that would equate to, but you know, let's say for instance, you, you've done, you know, seven or 10 houses per offer. You could be showing a hundred, 150 houses, but your commission is still going to be the same. So it's a difficult one, but we do need to factor in the realtor fees. Um, Ideally, it's good for it to be three and three, but if it's you know less than that, we we put it in there. Um, and certainly in this market, it's it's definitely I think more or less than it is at six. So let's put our realtor fees in there. Um, there'll also be a brokerage fee usually with a brokerage, uh, which is paid for uh, by the seller on top of the realtor commission. Uh, this covers administration fees incurred by the brokerage. Sometimes the realtor may pay this fee instead of um, charging it to the, the seller. There's some other fees that come in. There's the HOA stopple fee, uh, usually charged by the obviously the homeowners association. That can vary from one place to another. Um, it can be as low as you know thirty, forty dollars a month to nearly two hundred dollars a month, depending on where you are. There's the home warranty, which usually the seller will pay for. Doesn't have to, but you know, there's probably you know four or five hundred dollars there. And there's the appraisal fee, which obviously the lender is going to orchestrate, but the charge of this is going to be uh, with the, the seller or the buyer, of course. There could be some repairs that you may need to also factor in, and obviously you'll have to. Uh, work this out with the seller, they'll have to figure that out, but that could be another um, expense there that we've got to put into the, the mix. So there's some other fees that we'd have to factor in on this uh, seller's net. And then of course, title company will prorate the utilities, depending on when the house is being sold in the month gas, water, sewage, garbage, or whatever, They're pretty good on that. These are not big expenses, maybe a couple hundred dollars, depending on you know how much or when you're making that transaction. Okay, here comes our next keyword. Number three, I'll put a note on there. If you've not been able to fulfill those four areas, then um, don't ask for credit because I won't be able to give it to you. But this one is another A word, it's appraisal. So the appraisal will be the third keyword on this class, which is A-double-P-R-A-I-S-A-L, appraisal. Appraisal will be the third keyword for this class. And we're, we're now doing well on this and we're right at the, the last furlong. So let's have a look at this estimated seller's net sheet, see if we can figure out roughly what we might be um, ending up with on a $300,000 house. So, we've got the recording title deed. So usually around $80. Seems to be like the going rate with most title companies. I'll just ask any, if anybody's got any questions on any of these items as I go through this, we'll try and deal with them as we go through it. So any questions on the recording title deed or what the recording title deed is? Be good with that. Okay. We've got the title insurance. Uh, that's that big chunk we talked about. It's probably going to be, you know, at around the 60 cents per hundred of the sales price. It's going to be around that 1800 mark. All right. And you've got all your protections in there with that title insurance. And it doesn't just last for today, but it extends um, into years. 
So, you know, it's, it's mandatory and we obviously need to have that. We've got the processing fee, which is the title service. Um, not an awful lot here, usually, you know, a few hundred dollars. So maybe we'll just stick in 600 there. Any questions on tax insurance or processing fee? We've got the search. It's a real small amount of money that is, usually around $150 there. Then we've got this big chunk that comes in, which is the property taxes. That's that ad valorem or non ad valorem tax hit that we get every year, whether we're on a mortgage or not. Come the 30th of November, we've got to pay that. But often we're usually paying it with our mortgage. And the extra goes into some escrow to help us pay that by the end of the year. It's good to explain that to our clients because sometimes they're not aware of this tax. Um, they don't have to add it to their mortgage, by the way. There are some um, buyers that will just have it separate. Uh, they can probably, um, I think sometimes they can make some savings by doing it separately, uh, but they don't have to have it attached to the mortgage, but they are going to have to pay it when it comes to the 30th of November. Um, Stephen? So, yeah. So as a buyer, though, um, it, everything's prorated on the taxes, and it's kind of confusing to explain this, but a buyer yeah. kind of prepays for the following year, correct? Yeah. Okay. Kind of. Yeah, and the title will work out those figures. So depending on where they are, they'll work out what that proration is, and um, it, it'll usually work out nicely. But they, but they could say, the buyer could say, hey, I... I'll, I'll, I'll just pay this separately and not, you know, they could pay it independently of, of going through the, 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 the mortgage part, but yes. Very good. Um, there's the HOA, that, that can really, it can be a lot of money a month or it can be a, no money a month. Uh, so you can find out from your seller if they've got an HOA, if they have, you can slip something in there. If they haven't, then that's fine. Sometimes uh, there are some HOA platforms that would charge a percentage when they sell. So it'd be like a seller's fee. It could be a quarter percent. It could be half a percent. Um, but that can be a size amount of money if they're having to come up with that when they sell the home. So make sure you find out about that beforehand uh, because there are some HOAs that are paying a monthly premium. Plus, if they sell the house, there'll be another um, fraction of a percent that they will base on the sale of the home. Sometimes our sellers are not aware of that. So just make sure you find out about that. They're also charging transfer fees also. Yes, yeah. Yeah, transfer fees, yeah, also come into that. Yeah. It, it, it's one that we can get slipped up on if we're not uh, careful. And it can be, it can be a, a, a reasonably sized bill that can if uh, we're not expecting it. Um, obviously, we've got our real estate fees, um, and hopefully, we want to be on that six. Sometimes it can be lower than that, but that obviously is a good chunk of selling the home. Um, and we need to make sure that our sellers know what they're getting for that price. You know, we are going to be uh, looking after them, obviously, bringing a buyer to them, but we're making sure that they are legally right with the law and protected through the process. Um, there'll be a brokerage fee. Usually this is fixed, so you can easily find out what that is if your brokerage has got an admin fee. Um, ours at Presidio is $199, so I'll slip that in there. Um, there's a the home warranty that not it doesn't have to pay, but usually the sellers will pay the home warranty. And I think um, this market could change that, actually. Some buyers may say, hey, I'll pay my own home warranty. But it's usually a, a fixed price because you're going to agree that in the document unless you decide to change it um four or five hundred dollars maybe uh, on, on this size house repairs of course in this market there may be no repairs you buy it as is who knows but maybe there are some repairs and you'd figure that out with your client um, maybe there's a thousand dollars worth of repairs maybe there's less than that maybe there's none but figure out what they, that is and factor it into this sales net sheet um, there are going to be some proration of utilities. These may not be very much, actually, um, you know, because these work on a month-by-month -month basis. And 
I think I'll probably put in a couple hundred dollars in there. But you can usually work out roughly what that is. It's not going to be very much. Um, now there's going to be a mortgage, or there could be a second mortgage, or an equity loan, or whatever those payoffs. Generally speaking, your seller will know what they are because they get a statement every month from their lender. Um, so you're going to slip that in there, whatever it is. So um, maybe, you know, they've uh, done all that and you've, you know, you've got 210 that you, you've got to fund up. So you're going to add these all up and you're going to end up with a figure. So, you know, it's going to come up with a figure. So 230 odd grand there, 235 grand is what I owe on this property. Um, this is the piece we have to be careful of. We're talking about selling the home. You're obviously going to do some comps. You've really got to put the price in here that you're confident that you're going to get. So maybe you're actually thinking of selling it for, I don't know, 315 or 320, but you, you know you can get 300. When you're working with your seller, just make sure uh, you're giving them a, a figure that you're pretty confident will definitely get this. Uh, because then at least... Whatever they get um, in that bottom line, it's going to be more than that if you can sell for more than that figure. All right. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, that figure is going to be uh, in the minus. And then you might have to rethink what you're going to do. And, uh, you know, sometimes they may say, hey, this is not the time for me to sell. I'm going to wait a while. You know, or maybe if, it, you know, if, if they're just looking at breaking even, um, some realtors will put in some of their commission to help make that happen. Now, maybe you won't do any repairs, um, and, and maybe you, you know, you won't offer the home warranty. Sometimes it's really tight, but to do this early on is an advantage because it will at least give your your client an opportunity to see roughly what they're looking at when they get to, you know, that settlement in closing their home. So let's just talk about this. Has anybody, first of all, done or do a estimated seller's net sheet when they first meet with their clients? Has anybody actually does this? I do. Perfect. Tell me, Jenny, how this goes. Is it Jenny speaking? Yeah, obviously it depends yeah. on the client, but people love numbers. They talk. And so it's usually my favorite part of my seller's pitch is laying out those numbers and helping them see how much they really can afford or can't afford and what the situation is actually in a map out to look like. This depends on the client though. Okay. Tell us Jenny, um, what happens or have you had the situation where uh, you've gone through these numbers and then you've got a profit, you've got a less, a loss in that uh, bottom column. You know, you've got not green figures, you've got red figures. Yeah. It, it opens up conversation. I mean, it depends on how, Sorry, Jenny, you just got muted, I think. Just try again. Let's see if she can come back. Let's see. Jenny, we can't hear you, Jenny. Can you try again to unmute? Can you can you hear me? Oh, you just come back. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. I don't just, know just, what just you're doing here. <laughs> Yeah, start again. So tell us what happened or how you've coped when you've had a, um, a seller that you've, you've got down to that bottom line. It's either very, very small or it's even in the negative and how you've uh, coped with that challenge. It depends on how badly the seller needs to move um, and what they were, what their expectations were in selling. So obviously that conversation, they're expecting something greater um, and there's room for adjustment in some of these costs. Obviously, my commission and the buyer's commission is where that adjustment can be made. I try yes. not to do that, but I help them see that we can be flexible or we come up with a plan on when they can sell. Every situation. Oh, you disappeared again, Jenny. We got every situation. Ah, that's interesting. Okay. Um, I have a question. Maybe yes. Jenny can answer this. So I have only done seller two sellers presentations. I've done tons of buyers transactions, but 
at what point do you, first of all, does Presidio have a spreadsheet, a template that we can get? That's my first question. And when do you present this? Do you do all your homework the first time and then you go to their house and you present this the first time you meet with them or is it second or third time? First time. You wanna do everything you can the first time you meet with somebody to make your pitch. You know, because okay. you just don't know when you're gonna be able to meet with them again. Right. Okay. But I usually do at the end. So I'm doing my CMA, um, you know, all the comps and discussing, you know, what it's like to list your home, how to prepare to list your home. But then, you know, and we look at the timeline of when they want to move, if they're wanting to turn around and buy these numbers, I need to know, I need to know where we're at, especially if I'm going to be their buyer's agent. So I usually do it at the end. And it's my favorite part because it makes a clear map on where we're going forward. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that Presidio actually has a general sh sheet that people use. I did ask Jennifer and she said they don't actually have one that they've created. I think themselves. I've seen it on Facebook. Somebody had one and it was getting passed around. So maybe oh, I'll ask. So maybe that's what it is. Just take a picture of this and make your own. Just, oh, okay. Just thanks. <laughs> that would be too yeah. easy. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> It is quite easy, especially if you just use an Excel sheet, it's quite easy to put the figures together. But I think what Jenny said is absolutely correct. If we can give a fairly good outline, a little roadmap of where we go and what we're going to have to pay for down the track, it's, it's good to get it out early on because then it's out in the open and then there's no surprises. And if we're conservative with you know, what we are uh, buying or selling the house for, and then we are, you know, probably a little bit more liberal on what we're having to pay for, then they're always going to come out with a little bit more than what that bottom line is. It's better to be that way than then think, oh, you told me that I was going to get 20 grand and now actually, I'm actually paying 20 grand. You know what I mean? I, I just saw somebody in the chat box said most title companies offer these to agents for free. Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah. Whoever said that, absolutely right. Um, and, and often the... Uh, the title companies are very, very helpful um, with, with this section of the, um, the presentation because they obviously want to get our business. Good. Any other, so have we got any stories out there where someone's um, had a bad experience or a good experience on working with the seller's net sheet? I think Whatever you have to acknowledge you... that we're here to help people, not to necessarily sell houses. And so if you're really thinking about the person and their situation and you see that they are in a negative, you're not there to try to penny pinch them and get money out of them. I think it's, you really right. try to help their situation and it may be two or three years down the road that they actually can sell. I think it, we need to provide value rather than thinking that this is an opportunity for us to make money. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. They need to see us as value. Um, I always say that a uh, person that's selling a house is not looking for an agent. They're looking to sell their house first. The person that's buying a house isn't looking for an agent to help them buy a house. They're looking for a house. So we have to we have to be the value part. So they think, you know, I'm going to sell my house. I need to call Jenny and uh, or Carl and get them to help me because they they will bring value to the table. And sometimes when they look at that real estate commissions, which is obviously the biggest. Uh, line item they can think you know maybe i i can get that money myself or not i can just take that line out but then can they get through all the hoops on their own you know their, their business is not real estate so we have to make sure that we are giving them value for the amount of money that we are um, getting from the transaction and so, i like jenny so giving help help is the key we're helping our people yes christy no, last night I had a listing presentation and this is a family member. It was a cousin and he is kind of like, oh, we're thinking of doing it our own, but come give me some information. And I was like, that's fine. I, I just, I was in the middle of just talking about, and I wasn't even like, I hadn't gone over the net sheet. I hadn't gone over anything. And I just said, well, that could be this and it could be this. And he's just kind of stopped and he goes, real estate agents actually do stuff. <laughs> it made me laugh. I was like, yeah, yeah, we earn our paycheck, like absolutely. And it was an interesting conversation to have with him, who somebody who I care about deeply. And just, you know, he he was, I think he wanted to do me a favor, but it was like, no, I'm just here to give you information, whether you hire me or not, I don't care. You need the information. And so it was it was an interesting conversation that he could see that I did bring value to that 
to that purpose. So, yeah, very good, Christy. Thanks for sharing that. And also, sometimes this is a bit of a sensitive area because we're talking about you know money here, and sometimes you may have a client that's a little bit um, uncomfortable, you know, talking about some of the money that they've got in in their transaction that's got to be obviously dealt with. Um, that's what I remember we have to be careful on that yes i was going to ask exactly that um so if we're supposed to prepare this before that first meeting with the seller we have to find out what's left on their mortgage um you know so are we just going to the title company with all that info you know asking all that information and is that accessible to get all that no i i would i would try to get it from the seller themselves um, so it doesn't feel creepy like they're you're looking no at because if you're confident in the fact that you need that information to be a successful real estate agent they're gonna say oh obviously that makes sense <laughs> right. so i mean I, you can try to get it pre or in person i just say hey i'm gonna be asking you know, we're gonna go over some numbers numbers can always talk better than i can i'm gonna need to know how much you owe on your mortgage so we can know how much money you're gonna get out of your home can you have that before i come or when i come so are, are you sometimes just filling it there, filling it out there? I fill all the numbers out in front of them. I oh, okay. All of it in front of them. Yeah. I don't, I don't bring this filled out. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's oh. the best way to, the best way is to build the form as you go. Cause then you can explain. But you you've got to oh, have references, be. right? I mean, I wouldn't remember all those numbers of title fees and stuff. So. I would yeah, you, you, have those written down. you know the estimations that's all you need and you tell them this is not an exact number this is an estimation because taxes are going to change from the time that you sell versus what title company you want to use there's a lot of variables that go into this but at least you're giving them an estimated so at the very top it says estimated seller's net sheet make that very okay. clear to them okay thanks yeah and if, if you build it in front of them you can explain what these line items are and that automatically gives you more credibility because they then know that you know what you're talking about. And it will give them more confidence in, you know, having you as their, their realtor. But yeah, this is an estimated seller's net sheet. Uh, it certainly isn't accurate. And even, even sometimes when we get to settlement, sometimes it isn't exactly accurate because, you know, there may be some prorations that have changed and, uh, you know, some tidy up from signing at settlement for the actual, you know, the, the, the check to be sent or received. Um, but as we go down the track, all of these figures tend to tighten up a little bit and become more uh, accurate as we go down. But we should be accurate. We should be as best as we can uh, with the information we have, because then we are going to be in the right, you know, ballpark figures. Any other thoughts or comments or stories on using a, a seller's net sheet as an estimation of. I always use the net sheet and I think the most sellers have no idea about all these costs. So you don't wanna to get to closing and have them see these and realize they're getting so much less than they were planning on getting. But I did have a bad thing that happened a couple of years ago. I missed the last zero on my real estate commissions and I gave the net sheet to the <laughs> seller and I, I don't know how I missed it because I usually go over it slow and slowly and make sure my math is correct. So we got to closing and it was, you know, I think $16,000 less than he was planning on getting. And I just missed that last zero. That was horrible. So we worked it out, but it, <laughs> it was sad. So do go over and make sure you get your math right. That's a great point, Camille. That's a great point. I'm glad you raised that. Um, in fact, I've got a little slide on just that particular topic. Um, be accurate in your accuracy. Um, I think uh, we, we're talking about listing forms. We've got to be accurate in those, that we get those right. And then we get to this estimated seller's net sheet, even though it's not exactly what it's going to be. But we do be, need to be accurate in the estimate. We need to use figures that mean something. Um, I put here, both of these topics cover an agreement from the seller with you and your brokerage and multiple other identities that will need to be paid at the close of this transaction. So it's important that we be careful. We check our math, as uh, Camille said, because we can have some disappointing surprises at the end if we don't. Um, I've also said to review these from the outset can be very helpful to both you 
and the seller, knowing and understanding the agreements and the figures that you're working with. And as Jenny said earlier on, get this all out early on, right at the very beginning, because then people know what the ball game is, they know what they're working with, and at least we can build on that. Whereas if you go into a transaction blindly and you have to bring these pieces up as, as we go along, it can be um, it, it can be a little bit disappointing if they're not in their favour. And, you know, on that first visit with them, I always say, you know, that there'll, there'll be, there may be several different documents we have to sign during this transaction. We've just done the listing agreement. We've just done an addendum to it. Uh, but when we get an offer in, you know, there may be several addendums that we'll do uh, to make sure this transaction, you know, goes to close. And don't worry about that. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to help you get through that process. And I'll take care of all of the paperwork and make sure that you're clean. Let your client know that you are, this, this is a lot of work to do, but you're, you're the one that's, you know, looking after them. But let's try and be accurate in, in everything we try and do in this, in this, uh, this industry. I found a couple of interesting um, quotes here. Um, accuracy and agreements, I think, accuracy with our net sheets and accuracy in, in our agreements, that's what we've got to look at. And here's a couple of quotes I found. This one here is great by White Earp. We've got any uh, um, Western guys here that like to watch these movies. He says, fast is fine, but accuracy is everything. In a gun feat, in a, in a gunfight, you need to take your time in a hurry. I thought that was classic in a gunfight. You need to take your time in a hurry. Uh, and we need to take our time in our hurry. Sometimes, you know, um, there's so many pieces of the puzzle when we're working on these transactions. Let's just make sure we take our time and we don't hurry too fast and, and miss the important things. And here's another one from Grace M. Hopper, who was a United States Navy Rear Admiral. She says, one accurate measurement is worth a thousand expert opinions. Um, I've seen agents that have gone in to a presentation uh, style, and they, they've just talked, you know. It's a little bit loosey-goosey, you know, um, and they can talk well, but we haven't actually got any firm information. And what you're doing with this net sheet, you're actually giving them some firm facts. Some of the some of the facts on the net sheet will not change. Some of them will be variable, but at least you know which ones are variable or dependable and which ones are fixed. So just think about when you're working this business is try and be as accurate as you possibly can. Certainly in any agreements that we're getting people to sign. And certainly if we're working with a net sheet, let's get as much accuracy as we possibly can on that sheet. That will help us be um, better on that bottom line and give our clients confidence in our work. Anybody got any other comments on anything we've spoke about today? Okay, well, that got to the end of this. I think this is our question one. Um, I thought I'd let you know when the next Raising the Bar classes are coming up, the next three. We have one tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, one to three. That's the buyers A to Z and the buyers leads and converting them to clients class. That's a CE class. And then on Monday the 12th, um, between one and three, we had the buyer's presentation, which is basically the buyer broker agreement. That's a core two hour class. Um, so you get core uh, on that. And then on the Tuesday, nine to 11, so a little bit earlier than today, nine to 11, we have the new construction, which will be a CE class. Any questions or comments? You've been great to work with today. Thank you for those of you who have been able to uh, contribute and share your ideas and thoughts. It's always good to have your comments in this class and we greatly appreciate it. Um, I'll let Leslie Ann tidy up here as we finish this up, but certainly if your credit hours have not been banked, um, within the next few days, send me a note. And if you have any suggestions or ideas to make these classes better, then please do so. Leslie, Anne, are you able to tidy up this class um, with what you need? Yes, so here is the link again to the, the Google form. It's quite straightforward. It specifies what details we need from you. 
and uh, that they get submitted and Steve will log those hours later today. Okay, thank you, Leslie Ann. Um, again, thank you for being with us today, particularly those of you who 